In this video, I'm going to show you how to build the Polk Smart Big Bench, the PSBB, from start to finish. Hi, I'm Ron Polk, and this is the Smart Wood Shop. If you want to get a detailed set of plans to build a Smart Wood Shop for yourself or one of my workbenches, including the brand new Polk Smart Big Bench, you will find a link in the description of this video down below where you can go and purchase plans and download them instantaneously. 24-7, 365. I'm going to show you how to build the Polk Smart Big Bench. There's two pieces to it. They're identical, so essentially you're going to build one and then you're going to build another one. And of course we'll go through the process and make all of the parts and pieces at the same time so you won't be going from beginning to end on one and then beginning to end on the other. I'm not going to show you how to make the sawhorses or the spreader shelf for the sawhorses. That is identical to the Polk Smart Station and the Polk Smart Bench. I've done those twice now in those video series and I'll try to remember to put a link right up here so you can go and watch that build video. You will see me modify this pattern. The Polk Smart Big Bench, the Polk Smart Bench, or the Polk Smart Station all have the same undercarriage so any of the three benches will fit on that undercarriage. If you build yourself the Polk Smart cart, that's the wheels that the base with the wheels on it that any of the benches will go on including the Polk Smart big bench. You know that we had to modify the sawhorses that you already had and that is because the Smart cart came later and this modification had to be made. So I've done that now to my pattern, so any sawhorses I make, whether I use them in the smart cart or whether I use them standalone, it really doesn't matter, it'll work in both applications. To join the two sides together for use, I went with the TSO Smart Connects. These are the same Smart Connects we're using for everything else and all of the other benches. I started with the smaller knob that this is kind of the package. You buy them in, this in a pair of two and this in a pair of two and this is what I'm using on all of the other applications. I did find though that the speed knobs worked a little bit better because they're a little bit bigger and I'm able to crank a bit more and really suck the bench together a little better than I could with the smaller knob. So in the material list on the plan I am showing the speed knobs. They are a couple of dollars more but it is for a pair just buying one pair it's not that big of a deal and I do think you'll be a lot more satisfied with these larger knobs over the smaller knobs. I'm going to start by taking the four sheets of 18 millimeter ply to make up the bench top and put a straight edge along one long edge using the Festool track saw along with the TSO parallel guides. I'll do that on all four sheets and then I'll take the TSO crosscut the GR S16 and I will put one square edge off of that straight edge I made and again on all four sheets. Now I'm going to take my TSO parallel guides again, the shorter ones, and I'm going to break the plywood down. So I have four pieces that are identical for the two tops and the two bottoms and then I have six pieces that will make up the four sides as well as two additional pieces that will be cut down for all of the spreaders. With all of the pieces cut to the proper width, now I'm going to cut the lengths. Here I'm using the brand new Polk Smart Crosscut. This is a new design. I will be doing a separate video on it after I finish up the plans and get it ready to make it available. I'll, I'll do a good detailed video on how it works. But it has been fantastic. So I was able to cut my four uh, wide pieces, the two tops and the two bottoms, to exactly 2400 millimeters. I have an extended stop on this that adds 600 millimeters so I was able to set it at 1800 millimeters on the rail on the on the actual tape and then the plus 600 on the extended stop and I was able to cut again the two bottoms, the two tops and the four sides to exactly 2400 millimeters. I found this to be very accurate and very fast. I took the two long pieces that were just like the sides over to the miter saw to make the eight spreaders. 
And notice too, along the way, I also had a piece of 12 millimeter for the spreader template and the side template. And I made those when the tools were set up at that time so that I wouldn't have to go back just to make up the template, saving a little time. Here I'm making up the template. So this is the 12 millimeter plywood. What I'm doing is taking my time and laying out the lines to cut out on the template. I'm starting by putting the actual size of the cutouts, the finished cutouts I want. I find that it's easier to do that and have exactly a visual representation of the final cut. And then I use those reference lines, just for reference, to do the offsets. So each line is offset 1.5 millimeters or 1 16th of an inch. And then I will set up my strips that I'll use the router to cut those. So again, I start with the actual cutout or the actual finished cuts because I found that when I try to jump right to the offset lines, the little bit of math and figuring and, and pushing things in and out, sometimes uh, it's it prone to error. So having it drawn out on the template, the exact uh, final cut that I want to get uh, is, is just, I find, the simplest way. It takes a few minutes extra, but then I know that I'm right on. And I'm using some precision tools, my Starrett uh, Combination Square and my UJK 150mm um, uh, steel tape, all highly accurate, as well as I use the long, one of the long rulers from the Parf Guide Mark II. And this just helps me get very precise lines. And I'm using uh, the 0.5 uh, tall pencils. It might be 0.05, but uh, I'm finding that I'm, I'm able, with those tight lines, I'm able to get a lot more precision than some of the fatter pencils that you have to sharpen. I'm going to use my router with the upcut spiral bit and the bushing guide to cut out the openings on this pattern. So what I'm using is I've dug through my scrap pile and I've come up with some 12 millimeter scraps. I ripped them to the proper width for the middles and the ends and placed them, you know, so they're the right width and the right length. And then I'm taking uh, long strips and running them along the top and bottom. So I'm making a temporary pattern just out of some scraps to cut this pattern out. And again, I have done the math on the offsets. The plans show the templates on a separate page, a page for standard and a page for metric, although I highly recommend you stick with metric since the bench is designed around that. Regardless, if you're standard shop, this is the way to go. So after I get the pieces ripped and cut, then I will just attach them so that I can make the three cutouts with the router and the bushing all at one time. It's really clean and I'm not worried about the inside rounded corners. I'm letting the router bit determine the radius of those corners. In my case, I use a half inch upcut spiral bit with a 5 8 inch bushing and so I'll get the radius that that diameter bit Actually, that diameter of bushing will create. So it's a nice look. Not going to get square corners with any router bit. Of course, the smaller diameter router bit will make tighter corners. So if I were in a situation where I wanted the corners to be a little tighter, I could make the cut with the half inch bit on the router and then grab my cordless DeWalt router and without changing anything and just run that around the corners. And that would tighten the corners up uh, a, a little bit. I'm not going to do that. I don't really need that. I like the shape that it came out with and there's nothing really critical to do with that. Now with everything attached and clamped down so nothing will move, I'm using my Festool router. It's a plunge router with an upcut spiral bit and the bushing. So again it's a half inch upcut spiral and a 5 8 inch bushing which will give me that 1 16th of an inch or 1.5 millimeter offset so the inside hole will actually shrink a little bit in this case and I've done I've offset it because I'm making a pattern and this pattern is going to shrink 
the cut again. So I have actually offset uh, from my final cut instead of offsetting it 1 16th to make the pattern, I've offset it 1 8th, which makes it uh, the, the cutout, uh, the temporary pieces here, a quarter inch wider and a quarter inch longer. Again, I only have half of that left on the template. So the template or the pattern that I have will be um, 1 8th inch, each opening will be 1 8th of an inch longer and 1 8th of an inch wider and my final cut. So I'm kind of stepping down here, but this is a much cleaner cut than trying to do it, uh, say on the table saw and with the jigsaw. This just gives me a super clean uh, pattern that I can use over and over again. And because I'm using a plunge router, I'm able to plunge down and cut a bit. And then, uh, you know, uh, my first cut is pretty shallow because I want the top clean. And my last cut is pretty shallow. And then I'll pull the cut away fall off piece out, I'll clean it up with the vacuum and then I'll make a final pass and it just gives me a really clean cut for the bushing to ride against when I'm making uh, my four sides because I'm again I'm taking the time to make this one very accurately and very clean and then I'm going to be able to make these four very quickly and they'll all be identical and if I make another bench in the future I'll have it set aside. It's uh, I do keep my patterns and I I mark them. I've covered this many times, but it seems like every time I show this, I get asked, why don't you use a pattern bit with a bearing and then you don't have to worry about the offset? Well, again, I've covered this time and time again, but in answer to your question, I have plenty of pattern bits. Those are the ones with the bearing on the top and then you make your patterns exactly the cut you want. It seems like it would be the way to go, but it just isn't. They're prone to error. You can't really plunge in. That bearing is only going to be able to move the thickness of your pattern, so that 12 millimeters. If you go a little bit too deep, then you're going to cut into your template and mess up your final piece. The bearings, uh, you know, you try to get the speed just right and you coat them with uh, lubricant, and they still will have a tendency over time to burn and spin out. And when they spin out, uh, usually you'll get a bad cut in that place. I've just had them fail on me so many times and I used them for years before I switched over to these bushings. And these are less expensive because I use a standard upcut spiral bit which I use in lots of different applications and I don't have bearings to worry about maintaining. And all it requires me to do is do that simple math of counting the offset. And if I use the proper bushing, with you know matched to the bit it's going to always be one eighth of an inch i do indicate 1.5 millimeters because that is the sizing i'm going with but all of the tooling in the u.s for these are based on the standard system so the bits are one half of an inch and the bushing is five eighths oftentimes i use a quarter inch spiral up cut and that one has a three eighths inch bush three eighths inch bushing and again you can use any size bit, any size bushing, as long as they're a matched set. So that the differential, the offset is that one eighth of an inch between the outside diameter of the bit and the outside diameter of the bushing. So hopefully that question will finally be answered. Pattern bits do not work very well. They have a purpose. I use them in my router table. I use them for inlays and things like that but they are just a pain and they cost you more money and they will, at some point, you will destroy a pattern that you've worked hard to make and a nice expensive piece of wood that that pattern is attached to. This is a quick and easy one. I'm repeating the same thing I did with the side with the three cutouts. I just have to do the one cutout. This is for the spreader. There's eight spreaders on the two sides of to make up the single bench top. So I'll make, take my time, make this one, and then I'll use it to make the eight spreaders so they will be identical. Now I'm gonna make the bottoms up. There is no template for this. So to save some time and to make them identical, I've stacked the two bottoms uh, so they're flush on the long edges and the ends. And then I'm using a pinner with really small pins that don't go all the way through to line them up and, and hold them together. So I'm gonna lay out the screw holes 
as well as cut the sawhorse slots and the grab handles in the middle. And I'll be able to do this all to one and cut all the way through the second one. And again, I'll be double dipping my time here. To make the screw holes, I made a story pole. I took a piece of three quarter or 18 mil plywood and I ripped it on the table saw so it was nine millimeters by nine millimeters. That's exactly half the width of the material and I want the screws to fall right into the middle of that 18, which would be nine millimeters. So again, a nine by nine. And then I cut it to length. The largest spacing I have or the greatest spacing I have between screws is 240 millimeters. So I cut it to 240 millimeters and that gives me my layout along the long edges. And then I made bands all the way around with pencil that were the other screw distances. So I had some that were 25 millimeters, some that were 60 millimeters, and some that were, I believe, 144 millimeters. So I made uh, um, marks all the way around all four edges and then labeled them. And so I was able to then take the plans. I'm using the plans on my smartphone. This is a good example to show you how you can use the digital technology. Because my plans are vector files, I can zoom in really close and see the dimensions and exactly what I want to see. And they stay as crisp and clean as if I'm looking them in at 100% view, but I can see things. I find this a lot more efficient than printing. Plus you save the uh, cost of having them printed. I think printing up some of these plans can actually cost more than uh, you're actually paying for the plan. So money savings and I find that it works better. And again, I'm using it on my iPhone and most people do have a smartphone these days. With a small cross for each screw location, I don't show it here, but I took one of those spring-loaded nail sets and went through and popped a little divot in where each one goes just to help line up where the drill bit will go. And then I took the drill bit and it's you know sized proper for the screw diameter that I'm using. And I set the depth so that I could drill through both the top and the lower section at the same time. So I'm getting all of these holes drilled through two at once. Now I'm taking the pattern for the sawhorse slots. This is where the hinge barrels will stick through to reference where the uh, sawhorses nest up into the bottom of the benches. This is of course just one side of the sawhorse because uh, there are two bench tops. One will sit off to the right and one will sit off to the left. But because this uh, slot is a particular size and at a particular location dead center that either bench can be put on the sawhorse right or left end to end there is no right left i used the same pattern to set up the grab handle this grab handle there'll be four of these one on each bottom and one on each top in the exact same location so i was able to uh, when i designed the pattern for the sawhorse slots i made it the exact width and then to find center, I just put center cross marks on the cutout for that grab handle and then made center marks on the bottom here and just line them up and then, of course, uh, pinned it down so it wouldn't move. And I'm cutting through a little bit uh, at a time. Uh, this is I'm going to plow through 36 millimeters of material here. And so I want to take, you know, make nice clean cuts. So I'll just keep uh, dropping the plunge router bit down more and more until I get all the way through. I did the same thing with the sawhorse tab. So this, when I'm done with this, I will have both bottoms done and they'll be identical. I like to sand and route as I go so that all the pieces are ready for assembly. So I'm taking my 45 degree chamfer bit, just like I do on the bench dog holes and on the edges, and it's just barely sticking through so there's just a little bit of a 45 degree cut and I'm doing the sawhorse slots as well as the grab handle and I'll do it on both the inside and the outside on both bottoms. Now it's time to do the two tops. I have pinned them together just the way I did the two bottoms and to save time with the screw layout I took one of the bottoms and I just clamped it on, flushed them up and I'm using the same screw holes. So I've already laid them out. I've only had, I'm only going to have to lay out these screw holes one time. 
and I'll use this uh, same bottom as sort of a template for the screw layout. I had to go to a little longer drill bit so I could reach all the way through into both of the tops, which are, again, so I've got three times 18 going on here. Now I'll use my pattern to do the grab handle in the same location on the tops as the bottom, and I will cut through both tops at the same time. So again, saving a lot of time by using patterns. Now it's time for one of my favorite tools, the Parf Guide Mark II. This little jewel, it's a $200 tool, which for me is an incredible value. I, I just can't imagine any tool I could purchase for that kind of price to give me this level of precision that's required. I would have to have a much more expensive CNC machine or pay a CNC shop to make these for me. And with as many times and as many tools as I have that I use this layout of 20 millimeter holes, it would just be a no brainer for me to uh, use this. If I wear this one out from overuse, I'll have another one ordered the next day. Not only do I get the use of laying out all of my uh, bench top holes and router bench holes and all of those things, but also I use the rulers. These are highly precision long rulers. And uh, if you bought those independently from somewhere else, they alone would be quite expensive. So it's nice that I get uh, extra value out of my investment. Again, I can't say enough. I do. I know there's some other products out there that uh, tout themselves as as providing these um, MFT table holes, but I'll tell you, I just haven't found anything with the level of accuracy. Because not only do I have the layout with the rulers, and then the three, four, five of the two rulers, but then the guide for drilling the holes pins into those holes, so it gives another layer of accuracy. So I know when I use these bench dog holes on any of my benches that I'm going to get perfectly square, perfectly placed holes every time. I drilled the layout holes through both tops at the same time. So again, I, I took the time to lay out once, but was able to uh, drill all the way through for those index holes. And now I'm treating uh, each top separately. I've flipped over one and I am drilling through with the Parf Guide Mark II 20 millimeter bit just to cut through on the underside so that I don't get tear out. Now I have found that, uh, that it's best to just kind of do an onion skin. I went a little deeper than I needed to here. Uh, the reason being is that I'm not uh, using the layout tool that the Parf Guide Mark II comes with to drill the holes with the pins. I'm using just a, a um, manual or a little portable uh, drill guide just to hold the drill bit uh, you know, perpendicular. And I'm using the tip of the bit to go through the holes. But the, the thing is, is this, these holes are just to keep from tear out. And the deeper you go with them, if they're not quite right, then when you come through from the other side, you're, you'll find that uh, they could be off just a tiny amount. And I've done that a few times. So again, I need to be more careful than you're seeing me here and just tap through the surface. Here the top that I had on the underside when I drilled the holes, the bit was not quite long enough to go all the way through and I need the um, index hole to go all the way through to drill out those um, 20 millimeter holes the shallow holes from the underside to quit, uh, you know, to prevent the tear out. So all I'm doing is just going through the holes that uh, go most of the way through and just finishing them out to the underside. Now it's time to drill the 20 millimeter holes. These are the precise holes through the top. I'll do both tops. I'm using the Parf Guide Mark II, the Part II. This uses two pins that line up with the holes that were drilled with the um, rulers and the 345. So we know they're very precise and then we line up these. And then the tip of the 20 millimeter drill bit that's included goes in the third hole. So this really ensures perfect alignment, which on all the benches is critical because I use it for square, I use it for layout, I use it for attaching all of the additional fixtures. 
But also, it's more important with this bench because there's a there's two sides. They are identical, and it's going to be important that not only each uh, side measures a multiple of 96 in width and 96 in length, or a multiple of that, and hence that's how I came up with the exact length and width of each bench. But then when they're put together, it's important that when I measure from the edge of one to the far edge of the second one that I get a multiple of 96. Because again, it's going to act as a single top once it is uh, connected with the Smart Connects. So just following along here, this can be a little tedious. At, when I first start, it's like, oh, will this ever get done? But then it goes, I've drilled them so many times and uh, just have not needed to even consider a CNC machine. I'm able to get that level of precision. Uh, it takes me a little longer, but I'll tell you, the $200 investment goes a long way uh, versus me having to have a big CNC machine because I'd have to have one with at least an eight foot, probably a 10 foot bed, and those get pretty expensive. And, or I would have to take it to a CNC shop, which would probably be my preference um, because I don't want to get into the investment of space and uh, dollars and the upkeep and computers and all the things you have to do to run a CNC machine. Just not in uh, what I do. I'm about building houses and all the things that go with houses. And CNC just would offer so little for the investment. So I get my basically my portable between using the bushings and a upcut spiral router bit and patterns and then this Parf Guide Mark II, I get that level of precision with a much smaller investment, plus it's portable. Now it's time to chamfer all of the edges of every single hole. This is where this handy little DeWalt battery router comes in so handy. It makes this uh, quick work. It's uh, really the way to do it. There's some hand tools you can get to chamfer, but. I've got one and they just take too long and they're too hard. This makes it pretty quick work. Of course, I have to do every single hole. I do the top of the bench. I do not flip it over and do the underside. I leave those holes uh, squared out. Again, I'm using, I mentioned this before, but I want to be clear. I'm using a standard uh, 45 degree chamfer bit. It would do a big, I think a one inch chamfer, but I just have a small amount of it sticking through the base plate on the router just to create that small chamfer. This allows the bench dogs like the Smart Connects and pretty much most bench dogs on the market that offer that little chamfer so that it seats in those very well. So I chamfer all of the bench dog holes on the router tables and on, the, on every one of them that I have these 20 millimeter holes, I will chamfer uh, all of them. This is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about the hole size and spacing and the length and width of my benches. I get asked this uh, quite a bit and I've answered it and answered it, but we'll do it again here. The 96 millimeter spacing is a multiple of 32 millimeters. That is industry worldwide standard since World War II. It has to do with the rebuilding uh, the, after the war and all the machinery that was available to rebuild everything and the spacing of the gears uh, possible with the equipment at the time uh, was 32 millimeters and so that's what they went with. And if you notice cabinet hardware, it doesn't matter if you're building cabinets in, a, in the U.S. with standard or if you're doing European boxes which are pretty standard. Hole spacing for shelf pins and for uh, the hinges that you buy and for the drawer glides, all of that are all based on the 32 millimeter spacing. So this is a long time proven system. It's how everything is designed and built. And so my system is just utilizing the existing worldwide system. So when you see my dimensions on the plans and you see something like 1824 millimeter, you go, why did you pick that instead of 1800 or 2000? That's because it's a multiple of 96. And the uh, same with the size of the holes, the 20 millimeter. Sometimes in the US you'll see three quarter used. In fact, my benches originally were three quarters and you can get bench dogs and things, but I have found that most uh, things that I want access to 
are available in 20 millimeter. Sometimes they'll also be available in three quarter, but I found a lot of times the things I'm looking for are not uh, available in three quarter. So I went with, again, the worldwide industry standard. It doesn't matter uh, if I'm primarily a uh, American standard shop, this still works excellent. It gets me the square and the spacing that I need. The final thing to do before I start assembly is prep everything. So all the pieces are cut to the proper size, the holes are drilled, everything is milled up. Now I'm just taking off uh, pencil marks, sanding, smoothing out. It's just a lot easier to get everything prepped and ready to go before assembly than trying to do it after everything is put together and then reaching inside with the sander and things like that. So clean up and then assembly next. Well, it's the end of a work day. I got a lot done. Want to set up and be ready to go tomorrow. So a little vacuuming, push the benches up in the corner and back the truck in, ready to go for tomorrow. Now it's time to put the patterns to work. This is the easy part. Got the one pattern for the spreaders. I've got eight spreaders to make. So it's just a matter of connecting the pattern to the piece that's already cut to the proper length and width, cut out the middle, a couple of passes with the router in each one, and about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I'll have all eight of these exactly the same. Now it's time to do the four sides, again using the pattern. To start with, I'm going to use the layout of screw holes that I put in the pattern. So I only had to lay the screw holes out once, and that was uh, four sets of screw holes, and I'll be able to just tap through those with the countersink drill bit and lay them out exactly the same on all four sides. And then I will use the 20 millimeter bit that came with the Parf Guide Mark II, and that'll be to drill through and make the 20 millimeter holes in each side on each end, and that's to use the TSO Smart Connect Bench dogs. Now just like the spreaders, I will use the pattern and a bushing along with a half inch upcut spiral bit in my plunge router and I'll go through and make all three cutouts on all four sides in just a matter of a few minutes knowing that they will be identical matching parts and I won't have to think about top or bottom, left or right, or whether there's one, two, three or four. They will all be exactly the same. All right, with all the parts milled just before assembly, I'm gonna go ahead and finish up detailing using the sander, cleaning up all the edges, the faces, and just making it so that when I get it assembled, there'll be very little detailing to do. All the preparation is done, ready for assembly. At this point, it's pretty easy. I'm gonna take these spacers, two of them, one on each end, and that allows me to pre-install the four spreaders, just glue them and either hold them or clamp them and take the uh, drill and drill through the pilot holes just to have a pilot hole go into the end grain. I don't want to split the spreaders and so by having those holes that helps with that. And it's just a matter of putting in three screws on each spreader. Now I'll flip it over and do the other side. This second side actually goes a little easier since the four spreaders are already held in place with the other side. Now I can pre-attach the spacers and then just put the side on and go through, glue up all four edges and then pre-drill again into the end grain and fasten the screws. And that is all there is to it to make the frame for each side. And I'll do this twice and have two frames ready to put the bottom and the top on. I do make sure that I clean up the glue as I go. It's a lot easier when it's wet to take a chisel and just scrape it out and wipe it. I don't worry about squaring the frame. When I put the top on and the bottom on, that will automatically square the frame up. I know the sides are the exact same length and the spreaders are the exact same length. So everything will just flush right out. It's a matter of pulling the, um, you know, the long edges and the ends together. Now I use those same uh, installation or assembly spacers clamped in there and that will push those middle spreaders so they will stay nice and straight. When I push the outside spreaders in to flush up with the edge, that will automatically straighten up the interior uh, spreaders and put them right in line with the screw holes that are already pre-drilled. So it's just a matter of you know gluing it up first and then just working my way around 
and uh, you know a few screws here and there just working it so it's the edges are nice and flush and the corners uh, corner to corner is good and pushing the frame around again that just automatically uh, indexes everything right where it'll need to be uh, to be good and flat and perfectly square next up I cleaned up the glue on the inside where it was easy to get to before I put the top on and then I put the assembly spacers move them up to the top again to push those spreaders uh, nice and straight again when I push the outside spreader up flush with the edge of the top it will automatically push that interior spreader right where it needs to go then it's just a matter of gluing up and doing the screws working my way around I don't want to get start on one point and and find out that I'm off a little bit so I jump around and make sure all the corners are good and then I pull uh, kind of go to the middle and pull the the um, sides uh, out and once one side is indexed perfectly it'll make the other side index perfectly of course that all depends on me making the top and the bottom and all the parts and pieces the exact length so they match up the first side is completely assembled just going to take a couple of minutes here as usual to clean up and stay ahead of myself so I'm not having to worry about dry glue which is a lot more difficult to remove later on success both sides are completely assembled and ready to use well almost the next thing to do of course the most important step is to take the sander smooth all the edges make sure the last residue of glue is removed no pencil marks your workbench is so important you want it to look good it represents you you'll just feel better using it so take that few extra minutes and detail it out before you start using it well with both sides complete this will be my first opportunity to join them together and put them on top of the sawhorse support system that was designed to work with the smaller benches and it worked out just as expected i won't be building the sawhorses in the psbb build video here i've built these exact sawhorses twice before you can find them over in the polk smart bench and the polk smart station what i'm doing here is modifying the template so the sawhorses as designed for the other two benches work perfectly for this larger bench but I did a modification a while back to make the sawhorses work with the Polk Smart Cart. So I've decided to make that design element universal because they work just as well standalone as in the cart. And this allows, again, the, the sawhorses to work in every application. So I'm taking my template and I'm making two modifications to it so all sawhorses I make in the future will match up the sawhorse pattern in the Polk Smart Big Bench plans reflects these changes. I hope you've enjoyed this build video and learned a few new tips and techniques and efficiencies. Hey, if you like these videos, if you've learned anything, if you'd like to see me make more, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you'll know when I put up a new video. And if you get a chance, I would really appreciate it if you'd share my channel with somebody else. And if you'd like to support the channel, besides purchasing one of my plans, you could also use our Amazon store, which you'll find at that link in the description of this video. You can go there, use our Amazon store, curated store tools that I actually use. If you buy any of them there, Amazon will share a little bit with us and they won't charge you any extra. Thanks for dropping into the Smart Wood Shop. You stay safe and have a great day.